Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Johan Eklöv, and if that sounded somewhat incomprehensible, that would be John Oakleaf, if it was in English. Uh, I'm a Swedish bat researcher. Nowadays, I'm working mainly with bat conservation and bat surveys as a consultant, which basically means that I'm out looking for bats in city planning and road construction projects when building wind power, etc. And that's why I'm here today, to talk about the book, or the subject of the book, which is darkness, or rather, the lack of darkness. What happens when we humans turn night into day? What happens to plants and animals, and to ourselves when we kill the night using artificial light? So, today's talk is about light pollution. The term light pollution, uh, has been around for 30 years or so, but was first mainly used by astronomers. Uh, artificial light made the sky blurry, the astronomers couldn't see the stars. And actually, this was an issue already in the 19th century, when London-based astronomers complained about gas lights. However, since a few years back, light pollution has also become a thing among other scientists studying night ecology. And I'd say light pollution is still a very, very new field of science, exploding right as we speak. So what is it? There are some different definitions, but basically it is what it sounds like. Pollution by light. Just like noise would be the same as sound pollution. You can say that it is uh, all unnecessary light, all unwanted light or unshielded light, and in a way all unnatural light. Too much, at the wrong place or at the wrong time. Or light that affects us or plants and wildlife in some way. If we look at the photos here, we can see that the stairs to the left are very well lit up. But the light shines in all directions. It's actually more light on the trees than on the stairs. And in the upper right corner, there is some sort of outdoor seating area, but the street lights would have been enough. But instead, there is also a floodlight shining on the hillside. And the last photo shows a common type of lighting in parks, placed on the ground, shining right up on trees. This is purely for aesthetic reasons, and uh, has nothing to do with safety or anything else. Rather the opposite. It's just blinding. And all this is unnecessary lighting, just wasted energy, spreading light in the surroundings, contributing to light pollution. And all the lights in a city or an area creates what we call sky glow, an orange brown sky above all urban areas, seen from miles away, showing us how much light we actually waste. During my work with bats, I've come to visit lots of interesting places, like castles, 19th century factories, caves, mines, remote forests, lake areas. And the last years, I've spent plenty of nights at churchyards, looking at and climbing church towers like this. This is because churches are often inhabited by long-eared bats. In England, as well as in Sweden, it's very common bats. They especially like big attics, where they can hunt even indoors during bad weather. Their name is fitting. They, they have huge ears to hear insects prey, and they can hunt silently, even without echolocation. So this makes them perfect moth hunters, as moths usually hear bats and just steer away. Outside the church, the yards have been the same for centuries. It's lush, large trees, lots of insects, which means food for bats. Long ears are slow flyers. They hunt close to vegetation, listening for insect prey, and they appear rather late in the evenings, when it is dark enough. And the bat colonies, they return to the same place year after year in generations. And the bat church relation can be a thousand year old. Recently, 
things started to change a bit. The churches and the surroundings, they don't look the same anymore. From the 90s and onwards, we have seen a trend with more and more aesthetic lights shining on the church facades. My old supervisor at the university and later colleague as well, the late Jens Rudell, who was taking many of these photos in this presentation, counted bat colonies in Swedish churches in the 1980s. He found that two thirds of the churches in Western Sweden had their own bat colony. 30 years later, we did the same thing. We revisited the churches and also added a few more and found that now there were only one third of the churches with a bat colony. And it was all because of the lights. Dark churches were still inhabited. Light ones were not. A long year can live for 30 years or even more. And the record for any bat is over 40 years old. So in just one bat generation, half of the colonies have disappeared. For bats, darkness equals safety. And the light of the day is the same as fear of predatory birds. So the bats just wait for the night to appear, but it never really does. Therefore, these bats are now considered threatened and are on the Swedish red list since 2020. Perhaps the first mammal species on the red list due to light pollution. However, we shall not only blame the church, shall we? We put lights on pretty much anything, like castles, monuments, empty car parks, factories, storage buildings along motorways. And I went past Gothenburg University one night in July, and I don't think there were so many people working in their offices at one o'clock at night, as this photo actually implies. Neither were there no paddle players at late a late rainy October evening in the Swedish countryside. And that is what the cage down to the left is. If anybody is wondering, a deserted but very well little paddle court. And we turn on all these lights because we are day creatures. We need the light to see, to work 24 seven. And we like to look at and show off beautiful things and well, sometimes also not so beautiful things in the name of advertising. For example, all bridges are often lit up. The top left one is situated in a West Swedish nature reserve, being well, almost 300 years old. So someone thought it must be on display, of course. But the Dobenton's bats flying underneath, eating insects off the water surface, and even resting among the stones of the bridge. They shy away when there is no light. When well, there is a light, of course. Uh, the Bentos bats are quite easy to spot. And they're very easy to recognize. They usually fly about 15 centimeters above the water surface of ponds, lakes, creeks, back and forth in straight lines. And when the lights are on, they start to take detours around the bridge. And so do other bats hunting or commuting over waterways. Uh, a study of Dutch canals, for example, showed that pond bats always avoid the brightest spots of the water. But what about street lights? Every now and then you can see bats hunting in the light cone of lamps, attracting insects. Often, this is the only place where people actually see bats. And yes, some fast flying opportunistic bats like pipistrels and serotins, which are common in England as well, I think, uh, they patrol the darkness above the streetlights, diving into the light cone to catch insects stuck there. In the light, the bats can even take moths. Uh, as I said earlier, the moths normally hear bats, but they switch off their hearing in the light. 
Perhaps they think they're out of danger when it is not dark. Perhaps they are more afraid of birds instead and don't listen as well. We really don't know. But they turn their hearing off. So these bats, daring the light, in a way steal the prey from the more light-sensitive longing bats, which are hiding in the church attics, just waiting for the night to come. But even the opportunistic, slightly light-tolerant bats would never ever choose to live in two bright places, risking the safety of their pups. Uh, a streetlight is in a way um, a small of a sport for bats. Everybody has probably noticed at some point that all lights attract insects. If you're in a garden in an evening of August, for example, you will see moths, mosquitoes, caddis flies, and many more swarming around lit windows and porch lights. So this is because insects often orient themselves using polarized lights, stars, and the moon. Now imagine you're driving along a straight motorway. You can have the moon on one side forever, keeping the same angle to it. But if you pass a well-lit petrol station and try to keep the same angle to that, you will most likely steer off track and crash immediately. Same thing with insects. The moon is supposed to be the brightest object in the sky and also supposed to be very, very far away. And when night insects instead encounter a lamp, they start orbit instead and they cannot escape. They're either killed by exhaustion or eaten by bats or birds in the morning. And even spiders can sometimes benefit from this and eating insects off lamps. Now, considering how many insects a single porch light can attract, and then imagine a slightly bigger lamp, or why not one of the largest in the world, the Luxor Skybeam in Las Vegas. If your porch light attracts insects from your garden, the Luxor Skybeam draws insects from the whole Nevada desert. Following the insects are birds and bats, and everywhere in the world, whole ecosystems are shifting from the garden to the door, from the countryside to the cities, from Nevada to Las Vegas. This is called the vacuum cleaner effect. Insects are just sucked up by light. And sometimes <clears throat> this can have dramatic and more or less funny effects, like in 2019, when Las Vegas was swamped by migratory locusts coming from all over Nevada Desert, like a biblical plague almost, haunting the city of gambling and sins. But as ironic as it seems, uh, now light pollution is considered a main driver behind the ongoing death of insects worldwide. Equally, or perhaps even more important than pesticides, forestry, monocultural plantations and urbanization, and everything else that insects have to deal with. The brightest cities on Earth are approximately 1,200 times brighter than an untouched night sky. So if you have lived your entire life downtown, perhaps you have never ever used your night vision. You never really used the rods in your eye, only your cones. But you don't need to go to cities like Las Vegas or Hong Kong or Singapore, which are considered to be the most light polluted places on Earth. Uh, most city centers look just about the same. This is, for example, a mid-sized Swedish town called Norrköping. And here's a photo from northern Stockholm, right outside a hotel where I was ironically enough, having a talk on light pollution. So I can just take the audience outside and show them that, well, here the street lights aren't enough. Every tree also has their own lights. 
and it looks like this in many places. This is outside the small town where I live, between a recreation area and an industrial area. I spent a couple of hours here looking for bats for a project nearby. And and I, well, just for fun, uh, I counted how many cars and people were passing by and how many people that were using the sports facilities uh, behind the hill. Uh, that's where the higher spotlights are. And the result, one car, one cat, zero people in two hours. So all these lights were not necessary. And light pollution is not just a thing for major cities. It's everywhere. If we move away from the city, we can see how all the light eat the night sky, leaving just a shining orangey-brown sky glow. In downtown London, Stockholm, Paris, or any other major city, you can perhaps count to five stars. In a remote mountain area, away from lights, there are 5,000, at least theoretically, 5,000 visible stars in the sky. Which actually makes the darkest night skies appear rather bright. Just in the same way, you can feel that uh, the, the sky above the cities can feel rather dark sometimes. But you must travel very, very far to remote mountain areas to find something like this, or far out in the oceans. Moving even further, looking at the Earth from above, it is quite obvious how humans are spreading. Every street light Every city light and also road networks are visible. It's quite easy to point out major cities and highly populated areas. And if we didn't know where the main cities in Europe were, like Brussels and London and Paris, we could easily guess that. And if we look at Northern Italy, Britain or Netherlands, for example, it seems like Really nice places to live, as lots of people obviously have decided to live there. Only the oceans appear to be black. However, 40% of all people on Earth live closer than 100 kilometers from a coastal area, and we are affecting the sea as well. A British research team investigated what happens if we introduce light in the oceans. They used simple plastic panels or some sort of discs. Uh, some of them were dark and some of them were lit by small LED lights. And they lowered these discs into the depth outside the coast of Wales. And after a while there were corals, sea urchin, urchins, polychaetes, crayfish, different larvae, all sorts of creatures inhabiting the plastic panels. Seemingly lots of individuals on all plates. But there was one big difference between the dark and the bright ones. On the discs with LED lights, there were much fewer attacks. There were lots of individuals, but few species. So the light depleted the biodiversity. I remember this was just one LED light on the panel. So in a way, we can change the ecosystem using light. And this was in a small scale, but on land and globally, we are, uh, we are living in a giant experiment right now. Some of the first studies of light pollution were about sea turtles and it's often that story that most people have heard. Uh, sea turtles lay their eggs on beaches and when the baby turtles hatch, uh, they do that at night and they instantly look for the brightest spot. For more than 200 million years, the turtle instinct has told them that this is the horizon. So they should, if they, to find the brightest spot, 
uh, they look at the horizon and the setting sun. And that's where they're heading. But now, uh, today the brightest spot is rather the opposite direction, towards beach hotels and cities. And the turtles crawl the very wrong direction, across the streets, rather than into the water. Uh, this, however, changed a little bit during the pandemic, when tourist places along the world's beaches were shut down. And the beaches were all of a sudden dark again. And for the first time in years, the turtles were doing just fine. Outside tropical beaches, coral reefs are struggling, especially when sea temperature is rising. But they also have problems breeding every year. At a certain time and a certain moon phase, all individuals from the same species of coral spawn. They release their germ cells all at once, and the sea is filled with germ cells. And it looks like being inside a snow globe, almost. You know, the ones you turn upside down at Christmas. And it is very important that this event is well synchronized. It usually lasts over two or three days, perhaps. But when moon faces are hidden in sky glow, when you can't see if it's new moon or half moon, or perhaps not even full moon, the corals cannot tell the time. And the spawning is stretched out over a couple of weeks. So the mating success is therefore declining, as the corals did not have enough problems already. And the same goes for many other creatures of the coral, coral reefs and the sea in general. They rely on the moon to tell the time of the year and tell the time of the day. Like the clownfish, they live on coral reefs and they, they lick under the full moon and they hatch under new moon. Uh, you can't even get a clownfish to hatch in a laboratory if it's not really, really dark. And there are other animals as well, like polychaetes. They perform mating dances under the moon. And we have crayfish. They, they keep track on faces for many parts of the life cycle. And every night there is a huge migration going on where all sorts of creatures, from plankton, microscopic individuals to, to larger animals, migrate from the deep sea to the surface waters and then back again in the morning. And the full moon, or a fake moon, like a lamp, can effectively stop this. All living things, from bacteria to humans, have inner clocks, circadian rhythms, relying on light and on dark to tell the time of the day and year. This affects mating behaviors, migration, feeding, hibernation, pollination, sleeping cycles. And Humans, we have a cycle of a little more than 24 hours. Meaning that if we would go live in a cave, having no access to daylight, we would sleep a little bit longer and stay awake a little bit longer every day. Slowly pushing the day forward. Much like teenagers do. And we need the morning light to tell the body what time it is, to get the clock back in time every day. Darkness, on the other hand, means triggering of melatonin, our sleep hormone. Important, not just for a good night's sleep, but also for the immune system. Melatonin triggers lots of other hormones during the nights, like lowering body temperature, repressing hunger, and many other things. Everybody has sometime experienced jet lag after traveling over time zones. And there are studies showing that, for example, shift workers have a higher risk of getting certain diseases. And also suggesting that we, in a modern city, is under constant jet lag due to the lack of the natural darkness and light cycles. And this means there is also a link between different hormone-induced diseases like diabetes and also some 
some sorts of cancers. It is, for example, more common with breast cancer in a light polluted area than in a dark area. But we're just beginning to learn and to investigate, understand these rather complex relations. But already it's, it is clear that light affects us more than we are actually willing to admit. Uh, the brightest natural light is, of course, the full moon. And this is what most animals are adapted to. And this has been the case uh, since life evolved approximately 3.5 billion years ago. Everything evolved in a world where night is followed by day and day by night. A street light, a 150-year-old invention, is about 100 times brighter than the moon. And of course, animals get a bit confused when the sun sets, but it does not really get dark. We stretch the sunset and dawn into the night, leaving no space for darkness, really. One example is the female glue worm. She comes out as soon as the sun disappears, and she climbs up on top of a blade of grass, lighting her inbuilt torch, glowing with a soft green light. And she does this to attract males. And if the sun does not seem to set, uh, that is, the lights are on, the female glue never climbs up from the ground and does not light the torch at all. Well, there's no point because she will be visible anyway. The males, who are often a bit keener than the females, well, as always, they sometimes fly even though it's not really dark. But of course, they do not find any mates. But instead, they find streetlights shining at the distance, mistaking them for being lots of females. And there has been an ongoing uh, city science counting of glowworms in England uh, since the 90s, I think. And unfortunately, the trend does not really look good for glowworms. They are disappearing. And light pollution is, of course, one of the big factors behind this. In a similar way, uh, caddis flies also miss out on mating opportunities in a too bright world. They swarm over ponds and rivers and they navigate by polarized light, which presents the insects with a light pattern on the evening sky. Now, this is the pattern we humans cannot perceive. And unfortunately, natural light reflecting in water can easily be mixed up with artificial light reflecting from asphalt. So the caddisflies, they cannot tell the difference between a patch of water or asphalt. So it is just as common seeing these caddisflies at petrol stations and car parks as over ponds and lakes. A very easy way to kill a whole generation of insects. But it is not just insects suffering from this. It has also been shown in Australia that it is possible to postpone the reproduction season in marsupials just by increasing the amount of light in their habitats. There's one example with a sort of kangaroo or a kangarooish animal, can't remember which one exactly, um, living a bit too close to naval uh, naval base, spreading the light all over the place. And their mating season and the reproduction season was later and later every year. And the scientists could not tell first what the reason was. But the answer was the light from the naval base. No one has missed the ongoing debate on <clears throat> insect decline. The last years we have been uh, been encouraged to provide shelters for bees and other pollinators, which is, of course, a really good thing indeed. 
every other garden has a bee hotel these days. But we have failed to recognize the nighttime pollinators, like moths, which are equally important. In a Swiss study, researchers compared how many flowers are pollinated in street lit meadows compared to dark meadows of the same sort. I found that the pollination frequency dropped by 60% under artificial light. We do not know yet if the moths just don't bother flying, thinking the night has not yet arrived, or if they get caught along the way. But 60% less is a lot. Also bats are pollinators, especially in the tropics. 500 plants or, or more worldwide are depending on bats. And the bat in the photo here to the left well, the bat may appear a little bit small, but it also seems a bit heavy and it's actually pregnant. She has migrated from Mexico to America, following the flowering cacti, uh, which are showing their white flowers only at night. During the day, the flowers are gone, so they are only depending on the bats for pollination. And of course, the plants themselves are also affected, not just indirectly by the lack of pollinate the insects or bats. This is a common sight in parks and streets all over the world. Trees lit from underneath or decorated with spotlights. It has been shown that trees under street lights lose their leaves later in autumn than does trees in the forest or darker spots. As you can see, especially in the photo to the right, the branches which are directly lit still have their leaves attached. And this makes the trees more sensitive to the cold. And in the spring, the flower buds are way too early instead, also risking freezing temperatures or miss out on the timing of pollinators. Birds are like us in a way, in that they are very visual. The blackbird, for example, can sometimes gain from urbanization. Living in cities, the birds have a warmer climate, more food, often junk food, but anyway, and the light gives them more time to eat, more time to mate, both longer days and longer seasons. Today you can hear them sing all year round, not just during spring. But studying house sparrows, researchers in Florida have shown that a shifted day cycle stresses the immune system. Birds infected with the West Nile virus, they stay infected a longer period of time if they live in heavily light polluted areas, compared to birds living in rural or darker areas. Uh, they don't know exactly what is going on, but the immune system seems to need this change between light and dark to get its needed rest. And this is important knowledge if we want to avoid another pandemic in the future, we don't want the birds to be infected along the period of time, of course. Migrating birds, they often fly at night and gets confused when the stars are no longer seen. Flying lower to use landmarks instead, they are caught in city lights and collide with skyscrapers. The problem has been known for a century and Every year, thousands and thousands of birds die in big city areas. In some cities in America, there are actually people employed just to pick up dead birds during the migration season. Now, ever since we invented the electric light, it has been constantly spreading and <clears throat> increasing. Well, it's a fantastic invention, no doubt about that, but what the but with the introduction of LEDs some decade back, we have gone through a new light revolution. And light pollution is growing by a few to up to 6% every year globally. In a new paper, uh, the numbers are upgraded to 10%. So we are slowly killing the night entirely. Because the LEDs are so cheap that we can afford to put them everywhere. So the energy savings 
we were supposed to get from switching from old light bulbs to LED never happened. What we did was to install more lamps instead. I was talking about melatonin before and our inner clock. And if we want to fool our bodies into believing it is noon, we shall use as much white and blue light as possible. Because this light mimics the sun around midday. And that is exactly what we do. Screens, phones are full of blue light. And so are many street lights. Lab tests on mice have shown that we can cause liver diseases just by exposing the mice to blue light. But this is something that has been under discussion a lot lately, <clears throat> for a few years actually. And many screens and applications now have a night mode, minimizing the blue wavelength and instead using a more amber or yellowish light. So that our bodies think that, well, it is not noon, but it perhaps it is evening. But we humans, we, we are day creatures. We're born and raised nectophobic, more or less. And our night vision is not exactly the best in the animal kingdom. So we turn on the lights for safety reasons. We need to see where we are. We need to see other people. We need to see traffic, potential danger, and so on. But if you look at studies on crime, of crime related to darkness and lighting, there is really no consensus. Some reports that lights do have some effects in some places, other reports rather the opposite, that you can turn on light after light and the crime rate will stay, stay the same anyway. The problem is that the whole question of safety is often based on a feeling. We feel safer with the lights on. That of course must be taken seriously, we, but but still, we need to think differently about how we use the light. We need to use not light in a quantitative way, but qualitatively. If we, if we return to the, the churches for a moment, often I see this when I approach a church building. Is this really for safety? Or is it aesthetic? Or neither? I myself just get blinded by this. It makes you see the church miles away, perhaps. But when you're up close, it does not really help you feel any safer, does it? And it doesn't help your night vision either. On the other hand, I have never seen any people, apart from myself and some colleagues, visiting churches at night. And now compare with this one. Well, let's hope there are no bats in the belfry, or well, literally. But apart from that, it seems that many people actually find this more pleasant. It's like someone, someone is at home inviting you into their house. And the bats don't seem to mind, as the walls are not lit. Our studies on long-eared bats show that they will not fly past a wall lit by a lamp, which makes the wall brighter than 1.2 lux. That is, they won't pass the church if it's brighter than 1.2 lux. And that is four times the full moon. But the bats will fly here. And I guess you actually see the bat flying over the roof of the church. So there are ways to think a little bit different. We don't need to put out all lights, even though that would solve the issue, of course. But that would happen. But if we, for example, just change the blue and white color to yellow or even red at night, that will stop messing up our circadian rhythms because red light is closer to the light at sunset. In the old days, we used mercury lamps with lots of blue and even ultraviolet wavelengths attracting tons of insects. Then the sodium lights came along, shining yellow or orange or with an amber color, attracting much less insects. 
But unfortunately, modern LEDs have made it worse once again, although they come with a lot of possibilities to adjust the color. It's just that we do not use that yet. But recent tests on red light show that insects are not attracted to this at all to the same extent. And bats do not seem to mind the red lights either. In Worcestershire, uh, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, Eastern England, anyway, uh, the county council have installed lots of red and amber lights for, uh, for a bat and nature friendly environment. And this has also been done, uh, this is an example from outside of Gothenburg in Sweden and uh, in the Netherlands, they also try these red lights. But there is still a lot to be done. We do not yet know if this is a solution for any given situation, for plants, for all insects, uh, for ourselves. What do people think of this? But it is a starting point. There are other things, quite many other things you can easily do. There are, for example, so many lamps shining in every direction, which is to no use for anyone. It's just a waste of energy. And the lights often overlap. So instead, shield off and direct the light downwards. So, so we light the things that need to be lit. And let there be gaps in between the lights, letting animals through. Find out where, for example, bats live and where they forage to keep dark corridors where they can commute. And keep light away from forest edges, water, and other important feeding areas. Maybe we don't need all green areas and parks to be lit up. Let's keep at least some of them dark. And that also increases safety. If you, if you force people to choose the same paths through the same park at night, there would be more people there and also safer. Now, but with the, with the light technology of today, we, we can easily direct and shield off lights. We can adjust the intensity, we can adjust the color temperature. We can place the lights lower to the ground and further apart. But perhaps one of the best and easiest solutions is using timers and sensors. Depending on the time of day and year, switch off the lights when no one is present. In Stockholm, uh, a light company tried reducing the intensity of street lights at a one kilometer pathway by 70% when the sensors could not detect any people. But as soon as someone walked past, the intensity of the light was back to full. By doing so, they saved 60% of the energy costs. And this was before the energy crisis. So why just dim it down to 30%? Why not zero? That would save even more money. And nobody was there to see it anyway. So uh, the take home message is, if nobody uses the light, do not shine on the forest. And if we do these things, if we start thinking differently, if we adjust the light just a little bit, turn off the unnecessary lights, shield off, use different colors, perhaps we can see the Milky Way more often. Today, only one in five Europeans can do that. In the observatory in Gothenburg, they haven't seen the Milky Way since the 90s. And most city observatories around the world have closed because it's no point looking at stars in cities anymore. But the fact is, as darkness is getting more and more endangered, the more people try to find it, making astrotourism a fast-growing business worldwide. And more and more dark sky parks are opening. It's parks where everything is dark, or at least it's very, very little amount of light, so you can see the stars. Perhaps we can also see the northern lights occasionally. This is a photo not from the north, but from the south of Sweden, 
by Lake Vettel. This is taken by a friend of mine. He has, well, he has a very good camera. But anyway, more darkness increases the chances of seeing this, even in more southern parts of Europe. And in early autumn, we can watch the bat swarm outside their hibernation sites. An underestimated pleasure, if you ask me. And what you see in the background is not a spotlight. It is the full moon. And that was all I had to say for today. And thank you for listening. And don't forget, if you want to know more about light pollution and the appreciation of darkness, it's all in the book, Darkness Manifest. Thank you very much.